Today we're going to talk about designing microservice architectures the right way. And I thought to start, it'd be helpful to share a personal story that I hope resonates with many of you. So the names will be unnamed, but it basically goes like this. Could you please change this URL from foo.com slash latest slash bar to foo.com slash 1.5.3 slash bar? And the answer is, sorry, that would take weeks. We don't have the resources to do that. It's just a friggin' URL. And we have to ask, how does that happen? And in this particular case, this was a URL in a library. There are hundreds of services to update. Many of those services have not been updated in a long period of time, which means that updating that service means updating its dependencies, which just frankly takes time. It is actually the reality of the work uh, to do it. And incredibly frustrating, right? I mean, super, super frustrating when a simple task ends up being complicated or time consuming in practice. And this is where I think great architecture can really help us. And when we talk about great architecture, I think what we're really after is a few key features. One is this idea that we can scale development teams, develop, deliver higher quality software, uh, enable ourselves to have a choice. Are we really after high performance? Are we after low cost? And to actually be able to make changes that drive what we really like in our business. And I think one of the defining characteristics of great architecture, and this is the hard one, is to support future features nat naturally. And the way we like to think about this when we're designing something, do we have a good design? I don't know, I'll let you know in three, four years when we find out how everybody would like to use it and whether or not we made good decisions today. That's ultimately uh, a good, that's ultimately when we learn. And when we talk about not so great architecture, I think it often looks like this. People like to talk about spaghetti, go-to gets a lot of uh, memes out there. But I think really what's happening is we're trading near-term velocity for what I like to call future paralysis. And I think in the microservice architecture space, certainly we personally have seen this in many, many examples where we're tempted by the benefits of microservices and we underestimate or underinvest in what is needed to build a great architecture. And this is what we end up with. We end up with one to two weeks of work to change a URL. And so today's talk is about designing microservice architectures the right way, and frankly, how do we avoid spaghetti and make a perfectly crafted milfe where layer after layer itself is simple, perfect, and together the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Briefly, my background. Um, today, the co-founder and CTO of an enterprise SaaS company called Flow Commerce, Flow.io, where we build software that helps brands expand internationally. From day one, we built our company on microservices with many of the lessons we learned in our prior experience. Um, prior to that was the co-founder and CTO of Gilt.com. Uh, if you're familiar with Gilt, large-scale microservice architecture, I think probably over 400 applications now. Um, quite a large company, over 1,000 people, six, 700 million in annual revenue uh, at the point in time that uh, we sold the company to Hudson Bay. Uh, and I think it was there that we really learned a lot about the benefits of microservice architectures in terms of scaling teams, delivering quality, isolation, performance, as well as many of the challenges, and frankly, areas where, in hindsight, we wish we had invested more. And that's what today's talk will focus on. So let's start with a few misconceptions. Misconception number one, microservices enable our teams to choose the best programming languages and frameworks for their tasks. This is often cited as one of the big benefits of microservices. I can build one service in Go, one service in Rust, one service in Node, and one service in whatever language gets invented tomorrow. The reality is, and we'll demonstrate this today, it is super, super expensive to adopt new programming languages and frameworks. And really the bigger bar here is team size and the level of investment into the architecture. Um, one metric is, if we look at Google, as a generally great engineering company, uh, they have about, I don't know, let's call it 20,000, 30,000 engineers. At last count, they have eight programming languages. So I like to say one programming language for every 4,000 engineers as a good metric. <laughs> Misconception number two, code generation is evil. I used to think this. And the reality is code generation is just a technique. And what's really important, especially in these microservice architectures, is creating a defined schema that is actually 100% trusted. And today we'll demonstrate one technique that we use quite a bit where at Flow we're leveraging a significant amount of code generation in different parts of our software development process. Misconception number three, the event log must be the source of truth. Uh, so when we were starting Flow, I also um, thought this, 
And I reached out to Jay Kreps, who wrote Kafka, Kafka and wrote the paper, the definitive paper, I think, on logging that many people here have surely read. And, I, and he really helped us as we were scaling Gilt. And I said, Jay, I don't get it. I've got a REST service, and I'm creating a user. What am I supposed to do? Publish an event, wait for that event to come back to my service so that I can respond to my client? Because after my client creates a user, they may want to get that user's details. So how do I guarantee that I have those user's details? And from the horse's mouth, he said, no, 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 you just store that in a database, it's fine. And so that's what we did. <laughs> Resources are stored in databases that belong to the microservices. But then we guarantee absolutely, at least once semantics, that those messages are going to end up on the event stream. Okay. It's OK. It's OK. Misconception number four. Developers can maintain no more than three services each. This is certainly true at Gilt. Um, a few folks from Netflix shared that the ratio of three services per developer ends up being kind of this like magic number. And you get to that number, and then you stop feature development, and all you do is babysit and maintain all your services. Um, I think this is the wrong metric to focus on. And if you're having conversations about this metric, I think it's a clear sign that you need to invest in automation and tooling. And we'll go through a lot of the tooling we have here. Today, Flow, we're in our third year. We have about 100 services. Um, and the ratio is about five services per engineer. And every week, we ask people how much time is being spent on maintenance. The portion of maintenance that goes into maintaining and loving our microservices is less than 5%. So it's absolutely doable. So we'll touch on the Flow architecture, because this is driving a lot of the content today. So distributed microservice architecture at Flow, over 100 microservices. Each one of them defines a REST API. All of our services communicate via APIs and on the bottom, events. Every service publishes events of interest. Um, there is a Lambda architecture at the bottom. Um, but I think the key thing here is there's a lot of services that are interacting together. Uh, we do a few things that are quite unique, which is one, we don't have a private network. Um, and that means that all of the products that we build, our UIs, are actually built on the same APIs that we offer our clients. There is just one set of APIs and events to flow. One of the key practices, and I think the first critical decision to make in going into a microservice architecture is how are you going to manage and define your APIs? And here we're going to talk about REST APIs. We'll talk about events in a bit. Uh, this is what an API looks like at Flow. The very first artifact and step of software development at Flow is the design of the API. A few critical things. It's not in code. It's not annotations in code. It has to be language neutral. Um, here you see this is an example. We use JSON. Um, Second, we define resources. Everything is resource first uh, at flow. And that's why here you see a definition of a user. A user has an ID, email, name, status. And then by convention, to create a user, you use an object that is the resource name underscore form. So in our language, forms are used to create instances of resources. And there you can see the data defined for the resource. One small thing, just because it's 2018, GDPR, which is the new privacy regulation for Europe, which a lot of people have had to scramble and invest to comply with. In an API-first world, we simply added an annotation where we can, at a field level, say, for example, email is considered personal data. And from that, we can automatically generate a complete trace through every single service at flow for anything that may contain email. We know. We don't have to guess. It's programmatic. We know. And that's possible because we start with the API definitions. So we've got our user. How do we actually interact with the user? This is how we create let's call them operations on the API. What we really do is we take a user resource and we expose that. We say, here's a resource. It's a user. It has two operations. One is a get by ID. The second is a post. The post accepts a body of type user form, and this is how you create a user. So again, we're taking our user resource and then exposing our user model and then exposing that as a resource, which is what makes it available through the API. What does it mean for API to be first class? The API definitions are not in the microservice repos. They are in a dedicated Git repo called API. How do you make a change to an, an API? You open a text editor, you modify the JSON file, and you create a pull request. What happens when you create a pull request? Well, of course, continuous integration. Why wouldn't we run automated tests on the definition of our API? And so here you can see an example of a pull request in Git, in Git just on the definition of the API. We even touched implementation. Uh, people can collaborate. We can have feedback through the standard tools that we use. And on the right there, you see a set of linters that have run over the definition of the API. What's a linter look like? Here's an example of a real linter. So linters do lots of things. But ultimately, our goal with all of our, one of the big goals of continuous integration on the API definition is that it really should feel like one person wrote the entire API. Your customers don't care about develop, your team one and team two having different opinions on how REST works. They care about using software from your company in a consistent way. 
And automated linters on the API definition is a pretty powerful tool to just make sure that things feel that way. So this is just a simple example of a linter that walks through the entire service. The service is an instance of the entire API uh, and just validates that everybody has defined paths in lowercase, as an example. Breaking changes in APIs. So from a policy perspective, what's really interesting is like we're actually empowered to just make a decision to say we don't break things. That actually is just the decision that we get to make. We get to make that decision for databases and schema design there. We can make the same decision in APIs. We just decide. Don't break APIs. That's it. You just decide. Um, it really is that simple. Once you make that decision, though, and I think it's a critical decision to make, now you have to build practices around that. And one of those practices is to make sure that you know that you may be about to break an API. And so this is an example. Uh, these examples are from a tool called API Builder, which is something we started at Gilt. It's an open source um, and free hosted solution for end-to-end -end API design, so a lot of these practices. And one of the really nice things that comes native is annotation of every single change at a detail level in the API, including things that are breaking. So trivial now if you want to just add a continuous integration test that says, did you break your API? If so, the build failed. Right? And at least build a process to review it. Um, and so you'll know. You can build that into the process. Um, and also super interesting that this is happening in the API design phase. Right? So before we've built any code or really invested in implementation or any UAT, we already know up front that, wait a minute, we're on a path that may be a breaking change. And now we can make the decision, is that something we want to do, or do we want to course correct? And it's cheap to course correct, because this is the very, very beginning of the process. This is cool, by the way. I mean, I think it is. Great. So now we can go ahead and uh, start implementing our service. We've got our API, user, user model, user form, user resource. Let's go do some stuff. So this is the first time we get into uh, code generation. If uh, you're using gRPC or any binary protocols, you're probably already using code generation. Um, here, I think the really important thing about code generation is that there are opportunities to say the specification is, in fact, the first class thing that we built. Don't duplicate that. Anything that can be driven off the specification is an opportunity to do it either through reflection dynamically or through code generation. Uh, in particular, I've become a fan of code generation because it's really easy for any, anybody to read the code. And we invest heavily in the generators we write to make them readable uh, so that you can really, really understand what's happening without having to dig through um, meg and meg of source code in libraries that you may not be familiar, familiar with. So here's an example. We run API Builder Update for the app user. And this created three, this did, generated three types of things, a routes file, a client, and a mock client. So let's go and look at them. For the routes file, all of our microservices at Flow are written in Scala and Play. And in Play, the way that you uh, respond to an HTTP, HTTP request is you declare a route. So we automatically generate this route file from the API Builder specification. Get users by ID, post users. This is really nice because now we're guaranteeing that our implementation has these methods defined, right? Because when we generate the routes, now when I run compile, the compiler complains because these things don't exist. So we can actually have a guarantee that the operations that are exposed on our resources in our API actually are, in fact, uh, implemented by the service. Uh, another thing to note is user-friendly paths. Um, and we didn't actually specify the path. We can provide some nice defaults that are RESTful. Uh, and consistent naming. This is also really important. Users get by ID, users post. If I told you we had a feature called company, you could probably now guess that to create a company, it's going to be called companies.post. To get a company, it's going to be companies.getbyid. And that consistency, again, is really, really important because we want the API to feel like it was built by one person for all of our users that are using our APIs, whether they're internal or for our clients. Code generating a client library. So this is a client library that's used to communicate from, uh, with any of the services through the REST API. Uh, and this is an example of the implementation of the post method. This one is in uh, Scala using play JSON. But essentially, the key things here are this is entirely generated from the specification again and really friendly to use as a developer. It's dot .post, and you pass in an instance of a user form. And that's it. It corresponds. And again, the key message here is there's little value to developers writing this over and over again. And as you build microservices, you'll have lots of them. And you're going to spend all your time writing client libraries. And then you imagine you introduce a second language. All of a sudden, your clients want, let's say you scale internally like us, your client wants to interact with you in Ruby or in Go or whatever. Now you have to take all those client libraries that you wrote and write them again in every single language. Uh, and that work 
while valuable, starts to compete with work that you could be doing in terms of performance tuning, implementing more features, building new product. Um, so I think this is really, really important. And in the industry where I think a lot of uh, things fall down is when building code generation, I think a lot of people just optimize to make things possible, but that's not the intent. The goal here is to make the generated client so nice that a developer will love using it, because only then will developers not write their own handcrafted client library. And third, we'll look at uh, generating a mock client. We're going to talk a lot about testing. Um, testing has to be thought about from the start, particularly in a microservice architecture. There's a lot of asynchronous communication going on here. And one of the, this is an example of a mock client, uh, the actual method generating the mock client. And the mock clients that we produce in Scala are, um, they compile and they're fully functional. Uh, and what this really means, and, and because they come from that same API specification, it allows us to do high fidelity fast testing. We can actually write a bunch of unit tests and integration tests against the mocks and have confidence that those tests that we wrote are sufficient to prove that things are going to work correctly in production. Uh, mocking is never 100%, and so there's other techniques that complement this to get to that final, you never get to 100% confidence, pretty close. In practice, I would say uh, in three years, I can think of two bugs that made it to production where that couldn't be caught by mocks. And they had to do with network things, like authentication being a little bit different on one particular resource. Um, so we do this for everything. Generate everything from the spec. Now we have a good way to go and test everything. Um, great. So now let's talk about we're actually ready to write some code. We're developers. We like to write some code. So here's what code looks like at Flow. So this is the actual implementation of the post method. Um, user DAO create. We'll talk about the DAO in a bit. And basically, I've got a user from the request. U request body is user form. Either it comes back with validation errors, or I've created a user, in which case I can serialize the JSON. This is what all, basically all our controllers at Flow look like this. It's the same thing, over and over again, uh, validate and create. And so now let's talk about, well, first, I mean, come on, that's pretty, that's got to be, that's beautiful code. Simple to read, and that's what we want, right? The code that we're actually writing as developers, we make it as simple as possible, then there's even fewer bugs that we're going to catch in our tests. Uh, let's talk about this user's DAO and a little bit about database architecture. Um, first, each microservice application owns its own database. So the way we run this is every, if you need a database, you get a database. And that database belongs to the service. No other service is allowed to connect to that database. It is private. Like the database is not part of a microservices interface. It is private. Uh, every other service then communicates with the service either through the API or through events. And this is really important because once you let people in to your database, connect to your database through JDBC, you lose the ability to know if a change is safe. You just lose it. And that turns into actually an NP-complete problem over time. You will not be able to prove if you can make a change in the database. And that's hugely frustrating. When we talk about tech debt and all its different variations. This is a very insidious form of tech debt. So the solution is just don't let anybody in. It's yours. It's not part of the interface. Um, it works if we have a great API and if we publish the right events, because everybody else will be able to continue and do the things that they need. How do you create a database? Well, this is how you create a database. Dev, RDS, we're running on RDS in Amazon, dash app test, and you get your default settings. It's going to be called test DB. Uh, these are our default settings. You can change them if you want. Uh, but the important thing here in terms of investment and tooling is we have a single CLI that we call dev, intended for developers. And that's what all developers use for all, their common, all of our common infrastructure and development tasks. It's one thing. Want to know how to do something and don't know where it is? First thing you do is you type dev enter and you get a menu of a bunch of stuff that people before you have done that is now automated in a consistent way. Uh, this is super important. Has to be the same. Uh, one of the things I love, um, let me tell you, well, I'll share this anyway. I love logging into Amazon, which of course nobody has to do on a daily basis because everything's automated, and then just looking at our database names and they all follow the exact same naming convention. Everything is the same. Everything is automated. But it's only automated because somebody took the time to invest and make the CLI so that the experts in database do it once and everybody else just benefits from their work. We don't need everyone to be an expert in every piece of technology. Great. So now let's actually use the database. Uh, we're talking about code generation. We like code generation. So why don't we try to describe our database needs in, in metadata and code generate our way to a solution. So first, we'll describe our scholar requirements. Here, the package name is going to be DB generated. ID generator, this is just a flow thing and how we generate unique IDs. This one will start with the prefix USR for user. Now we'll describe our storage requirements in a psql attribute. We'll say the primary key is a field named ID, and our, we would like to create an index on the field named email. 
We then wrote a code generator that takes this metadata and actually creates the table definition, the data access object. And it's important to note that even though we're using the same tool chain for capturing the metadata and for writing the code generators, this has, we have divorced our storage needs from our API, right? Those are two different things. What does the table look like? Here's an example of the code generation that produces a table. Uh, and I think there's nothing fancy here, but there's a few really interesting things. One, uh, I personally hate debugging the difference between null and empty string in an Excel report. I don't know how many of you have done that. I hate it. And so from the beginning, we came up with a convention that we're not going to allow that at Flow. And we have these constraints in Postgres. Util, non-empty, trim string ID. And if you try to insert an empty string, you're going to get an error. Uh, and we're never going to have this. We're going to have good, clean data from the beginning. Because we're using code generation, this is how everything is. We have the ability to enforce a policy like this across the company. I think maybe more interesting is there's this thing called hash code at the end of the table. Actually, this came from a conversation with my colleague Matt here at the beginning. Um, as we started updating our records a lot, we kept generating all this load on the database, and many of the updates were actually the same, right? Clients just took their catalog, e-commerce catalog, and sent us their product catalog every day. And some of our clients sent us their whole catalog every hour. Not much changes every hour. And so what we did is we implemented a global solution that simply com computes the hash code of what we're about to do, and we only actually update the record in the database if the hash code changed. That feature is available for every single table at Flow across every single microservice, and developers don't have to think about it because we have the point of leverage of metadata and the code generation that we could do that. And that's a really, really powerful thing. We probably have saved 100x writes on our databases, and we could do it globally because we've had the discipline to use metadata and not want, um, what's the word? Uh, this is not a, creating and defining your database table is not a area where at Flow we value creativity, right? This is a known problem, we just need to get the work done. Uh, what do the Scala classes look like? Same thing. Uh, big thing here is just to normalize access to the databases. And specifically, one small thing to pick out, because we documented that the email column has an index, there on the find all method, how do you, you can get a collection of objects, you'll see that we can filter by an email or filter by the presence of an email, has email, email. This is driven by the fact that there's an index there. And the only reason I highlight this is because I feel like in industry, there's a lot of people who say, oh my gosh, things are slow, I gotta fix it. I created an index, I'm a hero, things are fast again. No, the hero is the person who prevents you from ever having that problem before. They're the unsung hero. And to do that, you have to think about this in advance. And one way to do that is to make sure that your data access layer is triggered to what you're actually indexing for retrieval. And then what will happen is the developer will go in and say, I need to find a user by email, and there won't be a find by email method. And guess what? Aha, I may want to put an index on that, and we catch it at the beginning of the design process and drive quality through the entire infrastructure. Great, testing. So here's an example of how to create an instance of our mock client for testing. Uh, so this is, we're getting a new client. In play, they use dependency injection, so we grab an instance of WS client to the play thing. The URL localhost dollar port. Dollar port is where our integration test is running. And here we put to some off headers to identify as a user. Pretty basic stuff. But what this enables is real tests that look like this. So the get user by ID method that we started with at the beginning, this is an entire integration test end to end running with all the mock clients like from the generated code. I create a user and now await, it's a future. Users get by ID and I better get back the user I expected. And then the second test case, if I get a user by a random ID, I better get back a not found, a 404. That's it, this is a real test. And this is using, actually using the mock client, actually making an, an internal HTTP request within the play framework, and we're testing end to end. And I will tell you these tests work because when we write tests like this, we, don't, we never find discrepancies in production. Or said another way, if, um, this over the past few years, through all of this focus on testing and really leveraging the specification, I've come to a point where I, I expect, our team expects, that as code moves to production, it just works. You're not surprised. We'll verify it, and it just works over and over and over again. Uh, and that drives quality, that drives team velocity. Great, so we've written our service, wrote our really beautiful code, tested it, time to deploy. So let's talk quickly about deployment. Continuous delivery is a prerequisite to managing microservice architectures. Uh, you can quote me. Um, it is absolutely essential. If your team is spending hours babysitting releases and you have 100 microservices, good luck. You're going to be spending your time deploying your services. It just does, it will just bottleneck you. At Guild, when we moved down the path from Monolith and started to distribute, uh, this was the first big investment Guild made into a delivery system to deploy software. And it was an excellent decision. It probably took us nine months to get to a point where it was reliable. 
but definitely the right first decision. Continuous delivery means a ton of things. What we mean is that a deploy is triggered by a Git tag. We like Git, we use Git. To deploy, you create a tag, and then tag gets deployed. And then in addition, the continuous part is we automatically create tags whenever there's a change on master. That actually triggers a system to automatically create a tag, and tag automatically does a bunch of stuff like go create a Docker image, go set the desired state. Um, principles of a continuous delivery system, or metrics, 100% automated and 100% reliable. Um, rarely, rarely do systems behave that way, right? And so red flag is if deploys keep failing and you're finding developers having to log into lots of systems to debug why deploy failed, all that time is wasted. And that needs to be fixed to get back the velocity across the uh, platform. Here's our, our dashboard, what it looks like. So microservices, when they were last deployed, a deploy just sets the desired state to the latest tag. Uh, and white means nothing's going on. Uh, and here's what it looks like. Oh, I should say, uh, we use a really uh, an open source project that we created in a week and a half at the beginning of Flow called Delta. Let me just say that again. Our entire continuous delivery system that deploys software thousands of times a week, we wrote in a week and a half. One person. That's it. You don't need a massive investment. This isn't an insanely large project. You just have to really focus on what you're delivering, and what you're delivering is a reliable pipeline to deploy software into the cloud. I mean, all these tools exist. You're just doing a little bit of plumbing to connect them. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, that's Delta. Uh, here's what it looks like when Delta says, when you change something in Git, GitHub sends a webhook. Delta says, oh, look, something changed in my project. What's the head of master? Oh, the head of master is something new. Create a tag. I got a new tag. I'm going to set the desired state of my project to the new version, so from 54 to 55 here and then just monitor, it just pulls. Is my Docker image ready? Great. My Docker image is ready. Hey, ECS, go deploy my Docker image. And it just monitors, that's it. It doesn't do anything fancy, right? Configuration. So I will say, uh, I won't speak for everyone. I don't like describing my infrastructure needs with 10,000 lines of JSON. Uh, I don't understand it. I don't know what security groups are. I don't know what VPNs are. I'm a software developer, right, in that role. And so I think one of the key things for microservice infrastructure is really, really to try to get it down to the most basic elements um, and let the people who understand infrastructure make these recommendations for the company. Uh, and this is what our configuration looks like for uh, deploying stuff. It's six lines of YAML. And uh, if you needed a bigger instance, my guess is everyone here could figure out how to do it. Uh, and that's what we want, right? Self-documenting. Um, another key thing that we see, we do and we see all over the place is standardized health checks. Um, and ours run on internal health check. It's just a standard URL that's well known. Every service implements this. How do they implement this? They pull in the specification of the health check from the API spec, because how else would you expose an endpoint, right? And so here we see a simple model called health check, which just has status. We say healthy when healthy, otherwise we describe the problem. 200 healthy means good, 422 text means bad. Um, and this is really important. I mean, it's just a critical element, but just to institutionalize some type of health check into all the microservices, even if at the beginning it's just returning a 200, at least you've got the placeholder to add checks in the future. Things that services do, make sure they have access to their database, make sure that any environment variables are actually available in production. And what this allows us to do is during a deploy, if any of that isn't ready, that instance just fails to become healthy and is never put into traffic, and then we can go debug whatever happened at the deploy and do that on our own time as opposed to having an issue in production. And now it's time to talk about events. Um, so the way I like to describe our APIs at Flow, we're incredibly proud of them. You, everything we do is API first. It's beautiful, it's well documented, they're simple, they're consistent. Perfectly happy if we never used our APIs. We'd prefer you to use our event streams instead. Um, and more than that, our own internal network, we don't want to use our APIs at all. There are a few rare examples where you really, really need synchronous operations, and in those instances, we will make API calls. For everything else, our own services just consume events and process everything asynchronously. And I think there's been a lot of talks on this, particular, I think this year, even more momentum around this sort of approach, uh, and it, it really, really works, uh, but requires, again, an investment to make the tooling right. So let's talk first about a few principles of an event interface. First class schema for all events. You have to have events in a well-defined schema. Everyone who's using binary formats like gRPC is in great shape. Everyone who's using things like Swagger is in terrible shape. Um, the big difference there is binary formats force developers to use the code generation to produce and consume events 
which is a good way of guaranteeing that the schema is in fact correct. And regardless of the tooling that's used, that correctness uh, for the events in the APIs is critical, critical, critical to make sure it is true. If you find an example in the organization where behavior in production differs from the declared spec, in my opinion, that's like the uh, Toyota Kaizen process. You pull the alarm, everybody stops, and you fix the process so that can never happen again. Because if developers lose trust in the specification, it turns into an incredibly huge bottleneck in software development. Um, all of our producers guarantee at least once delivery. All of our consumers must assume multi-deliveries and therefore have to implement item potency, right? So those are the semantics we, cho we chose. I think today quite common. Uh, it works, puts a little bit more emphasis on the consumers to make sure that they implement item potency, uh, but keeps the system quite reliable. And just a few metrics. Uh, we're built on top of Kinesis, which has some inherent latency on it, but end-to-end -end single event latency at flow is about half a second, right? So this is from time database record created, uh, published to Kinesis, consumed on the other side, and some action taken on it, uh, which for almost everything that we do uh, is plenty. Um, and the things that need to be faster end up being either, actually, we, we've never had to do anything faster. We just do those few things synchronously. Uh, and our system is based on Postgres. We'll walk through how we do it. Um, we emphasize a simple system that was easy to debug um, and, frankly, low tech. Uh, and we'll walk through, but it still is scaling to about a billion events per day per service, which, again, for many use cases, by far, I think the majority of use cases that many of us interact with on a daily basis is plenty. So here's how we do it. So on the producers, we create a journal of all operations on the table. The journal basically just stores every insert, update, delete, along with the operation on that table. So we have a complete history of everything that ever happened. And so in the user's table, you can think of the record in the user's table as the current view of that user record. And then behind it, there'll be a journal user's table which has every single operation. Um, when we insert into the journal table, we queue that journal record to be published. Real time, asynchronously, we publish one event per journal record, right? Insert into users, insert into journal users, insert into a queue that there is a journal record to publish, notify, we use actors, notify an actor that something has changed, Actor comes in, gets a bunch of work, and publishes them to Kinesis. Um, replay becomes quite simple, because you can either just requeue the record, or frankly, what developers do is just update the update user set ID equal ID, where ID is five, and it just goes through the chain again, and that user gets published. So replay becomes quite simple. On the consumer side, consumers read off of Kinesis, get a batch of records. They actually insert them into a local database. Uh, into their local database in basically temporary storage. It is partitioned for fast removal. On event arrival, we queue that there is an event to be consumed, send a message to an actor that something new has come in, and then we do this in micro batches by default every 250 milliseconds. We grab a batch of all the new events and then process them in the app. Uh, any failures are recorded locally and published to a monitoring system. Um, so that uh, you, you actually see. We will receive notifications if there are kind of, if we see any buildup in failure queues. And then operationally, we work so that there are no failures, and failures are treated first class. It's not a product, usually not a production issue, but within hours gets looked at, resolved, and often the solution is either a bug fix or a replay or something. Um, but I think visibility on errors is super important, right? And by having a local copy of the event in the consumer, once you fix the bug that caused the error to happen in the first place, you just re-trigger the event to be processed. You don't have to leave. You don't have to go back to Kinesis. You don't have to go back to the producer because you have a local copy of your event. You fix the problem. You actually have all the data, so it's really easy to write a test case for it, fix the problem, and then just requeue the record to be pro processed. Um, this is how we define our event schemas. Um, again, we like to use the same. We like one tool for everything, less to learn. Uh, and we use the same tool, in this case, API Builder, to define our events. So the way this works is we define one model per event. In this case, for users, we have two events, one called user upserted, so user is inserted, an insert or an update on a user, and the second called user deleted, where a user was deleted. Those are the two models. We group models into union types, and so n event types will go into a single union type. In this case, the union type is called user underscore event by convention. The first part is the name of the microservice user. The second part is the word event. Um, our convention is important because we have a linter that will go through on events, right? Um, and then we can say that every union type maps to a single stream in Kinesis. Um, and this is nice because now we can control, 
you know, if we have a very high, a high velocity event, very easy to just give it a dedicated stream. But generally, the common case is that a stream, a, a microservice will publish, will have one union type that's published to one stream for others to consume. Streams are owned by exactly one service. So if there is a user event, it can only be published by a single microservice. That way, you can go back to the source. Um, and again, most services define exactly one stream. Here's an example of what a linter looks like for events. So um, one of the things we do is every event must have a field called timestamp. It must be in the documentation, the second field. Uh, the third field, if uh, we're a SaaS platform, we identify our customers by a, a field called organization. So if this is a model that is organization specific, the third field will be the word organization. If the model has a field called number, for example, that will be the fourth field. And so really pedantic stuff. But at the end of the day, all of our events look the same. You consume a user event, you can probably guess what a company event looks like. It'll have the exact same structure. Uh, and that, again, super important. And actually enables, when you have this kind of consistency, it really enables you to do uh, interesting things like uh, consistently drive and drop your events into a data warehouse, for example. You can actually do that programmatically because you have consistency. Um, what's the database look like? We talk about journaling. Oh, we have metadata that describes our storage requirements. This is a new storage requirement. We'll call it journal. And journal has two attributes, how long and how frequent. So this one, we're going to journal data for three days. What this actually does in the database is create partitions that are daily. And on day four, we'll drop uh, the old partition from four days ago. Uh, we use a couple of libraries. One is a journaling library for Postgres written by Ryan Martin from Gilt. Uh, and second is we use Partition Manager, which I think is from Keith at OmniTI, but a great library for partitioning on Postgres. Um, and I know he's optimistic that finally we're going to get native partitioning. I know we have native partitioning in Postgres 10, and I think by 11, we're, we're hopeful that the feature set that we need will become native. Uh, but that's it. All a developer has to do is declare the retention policy, and these journals are created for them. Now we'll go to app code. How do we actually publish? First thing we need to do is get a stream. How do you get a stream? Uh, we have a library for eventing uh, that, frankly, we invested a lot of time to build so that the developer experience of working with events was easy and simple. So here's an example. Uh, Q is our internal library. I'm going to be producing user events. Q.producer, type tag user event. And you'll see nowhere in here you're going to see the stream name. Like, why should somebody have to write a stream name? They don't care. We can use reflection and figure out what stream we should be publishing to and just make sure it's consistent. In the stream name, you'll note a, note a dot JSON at the end. This is so in cases where we like JSON because it works everywhere, but in cases where you actually need a binary format, you can switch that and publish to a stream where essentially we embed the content type in the name of the stream. stream. This is the actual code to produce an event. Um, takes an instance of a user version. The user version maps to a record from the journal table. All of that, again, is code generated. Developers don't have to worry about that. What a developer has to worry about is actually publishing the event that they want. And this is exactly what they do. Given a version of a user, I'm going to go ahead and publish, if it was an insert update, publish an upserted, otherwise publish a deleted. Um, and interestingly, because we've co-generated the interfaces to this data, what happens is all of our app code starts to look the same. right? And now when we think about an unspoken benefit is any one of the developers on the back end team can actually drop into any one of the other microservices and be productive. Yes, they need to have domain knowledge and context and all that, but it all behaves the same, right? And so the learning curve as teams shift around and people move around really goes away, uh, and we can, again, stay focused on building product. Um, testing. Testing is super important. This is an actual test that goes end to end on, on uh, publishing an event on user creation. So we create a user, and then eventually, our stream must contain an event of type user upserted where the ID, email, and name match the user we created. End-to-end -end test, that's it. Um, and again, we've invested a lot of time in the library around streaming so that when this test passes locally, it works in production. And the only difference in production is instead of an in-memory uh, queue, we're now, we now have network and kinesis, right? But from an interface perspective for all of us as developers, it doesn't matter. High fidelity uh, testing. And similarly, on the consumer side, this is what it looks like. You receive a user event. Uh, payload is JSON. Um, cast it to a user event. And then we can pattern match and just store a copy of the event. And we do this quite a bit. We really publish events. And then if, if I need to operate on users, I keep my own copy of users locally. 
uh, and then interact with that data there. Uh, similarly, testing on the consumer side, again, we spent a lot of time here making sure that it's simple to write tests. Investment to make it simple to write tests. Factories make user upserted. Factories, you can probably guess, was co-generated based on the API spec and gives us an instance of the user upserted event. I can publish it to my mock stream, and then in a few uh, milliseconds, we'll see that that got stored in my local database. And so again, I can just go check my database. So this is an end-to-end -end test. Event published, my consumer picked it up, and shortly thereafter, stored a copy in my local database, and I can keep building on this. Um, critically, critically important. So now our service is in production, it's working, we have a database, we can create users, everything is great, we're done, right? Now, dependencies. Um, this is where things get really interesting. There's a decision to make in microservices to paint the two broad extremes. One extreme is once it's deployed, you never touch it. Then factor in if you need to make an improvement, you might as well rewrite it. Um, or on the flip side, you can decide to pay a tax as you go and just keep your dependencies up to date. We've chosen to pay that tax. Um, and our goal, really, in dependency management is to be able to automatically update all of our services to the latest dependencies. Uh, and this is, I think this is the right thing to do. It's debatable, because there's a tax you pay as you go. But it means that if there's a critical security update in a library, we can get it out to all our services in hours. If we have a critical bug fix in our core libraries, we can get it out in hours. Um, and it should take hours, not weeks or months. Um, and interestingly, we thought a lot about making sure that the process we use for the software that we develop internally was the same as the process we use for all our open source libraries. It's the same. It's just code. I don't care if I know the author personally or we sit at the same table. It's, at the end of the day, it's just a library, it's just code. We should have the same process, whether we're together or apart. Um, at Flow, process-wise, we upgrade our services generally at least once a week. Our process is once a week, but I think this week we did it twice. In fact, we did it this morning, uh, around 10.30 a.m. It was done at 11.30. Um, and so uh, we've really invested in the tooling here. And I think this is one of the best things that we've done. And I honestly have, and I don't see this much in industry myself. Um, this is dependency.flow.io is an open source project that we built um, early on in the days of Flow. And what it does is you add, you connect to GitHub and you add a project. It then crawls your project and extracts all the dependencies automatically, your libraries, your binaries. It then crawls all the resolvers all over the world and keeps track of every library and every version of every library. And then is able to turn that into an event stream back to you, the human, to say, hey, this project, I have some recommendations for you. For my user project, you're using libvalidation 0017. I would like to suggest that you upgrade to 0018. And there is a crazy, if you're into this stuff, there's a crazy version tag parser built on Scala parser combinators, if you're into that sort of thing. And it friggin' works, so there are no false positives, which is what drives the kind of the quality of the automation. Um, if you're into Scala, it's actually, um, um, what is it, cross-build aware. And so if you're on Scala 10, you're not going to get a recommendation to upgrade to a 2.11 library, that sort of thing. Big investment, but it's worth it because once a week we can type, this, this script's written in Scala, Ammonite scripts, upgrade, upgrade.sc. It reaches out to the dependency REST API. It has its own REST API, of course. It comes back with a list of recommendations for all our projects, upgrades our dependencies, and then creates a pull request, right? So when this happens, uh, actually, funny story, you know those um, services that tell you who in your team is productive based on analyzing Git usage? Uh, we had them analyze us, and we were monsters in their system because of all of these pull requests that we were submitting to, gil to Git on a weekly basis. Uh, it's amazing contribution history. Uh, but this is it. You run one command, and we have PRs for everything. And because we spent so much time on our testing, the policy is once it's green, we deploy. That's it, right? And now we can do that every single week. And all of our applications are running on the latest versions of every piece of software. And we just nurture them and feed them every single week. So in summary, just to really just focus in on kind of three critical decisions, I think the first one is really to design your schema first for all of your APIs and events. Um, and in there, to really focus on consuming the events, not the API. Have the API, but by all means, if you can use the events, use the events. You're going to get so many benefits. Second is a high level of investment in automation across the board. Uh, this is really important, whether it's the code generators, the deployment system, the dependency management, a real, real investment in automation. And when we think about polyglot and microservices in different languages, this is where we have to be really careful. Because every language, every framework that we choose to add into our infrastructure, all of those things that we just saw that allow us to be efficient in delivering our microservices, now need to be built to take into account that new language and that new framework. And it's a, I mean, fr uh, frankly, it's a huge investment. 
huge investment. Uh, and I think that's what needs to be considered, which is why I think when we look at you know, 4,000 employees per engineers per language, it's like having the resources and the time to make it a priority to invest is absolutely critical uh, to being able to do this successfully. Uh, and third, I think there's this focus on enabling teams to write amazing and simple tests, drive quality, streamline maintenance, enable continuous delivery. Imagine if you didn't tr tr trust your tests and you want to upgrade your dependencies. What are you going to do? How are you going to verify? What's, you know, how much time is it actually going to take before you feel confident to deploy? Um, yesterday, I'm going to tell a little story about testing. So yesterday, uh, I was on an airplane. And as I like to do on an airplane, I'm writing tests. And I'm writing tests against production. Because uh, that is a really good way to build quality software. And in this case, this was a bug that was reported by a user. And I said, well, this complicated bug involves lots of services and orchestration. I'm going to just write a test that sets up everything in production. And I got to the end, and actually the test passed. And it's like frustrated because I thought there was a bug and there was no bug. We now publish, that test now runs every single day. It's a cron job that's running against production. This morning, a slight variation was reported. I said, aha, we have the framework. Wrote the test to demonstrate the bug in production, and yes, there was a bug. And I think uh, I like to call it TDD in production. Wrote the test. The test is failing against production. Have now been able to go into the microservice, replicate the test, replicate the bug in the microservice, write the unit test in the microservice. That unit, that microservice is getting deployed. And when that deploy finishes, we can now go run the production test and verify that the production test now passes. So TDD in production. And it feels so amazing to be able to do that. And at the end of the day, it's one of those critical elements that goes overlooked. How can we really get to the point where we're so confident in our tests that we can do all of these other things and automate the maintenance so that we can actually get the benefits of these architectures, because there are a lot of benefits, without paralyzing our teams at the end of the day. So thank you very much. Go forth and design microservice architectures the right way. And I think we may have time for one or two questions. I'm happy to stay after as well. Um, yes, sir, there's a microphone next to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, how, do you, how do you balance um, new features that aren't ready yet and uh, continuous deployment? Right? Delivery. So do you have branches? Do you have a separate data environment? How do you handle that? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, how do we manage features at different stages of development? So um, my. Uh, I'll talk personally. Uh, I can't go to sleep if I have an open PR. I can't. And I don't want to, and I don't. And so everything that I do in my life is optimized so that however much time I have, when I'm done, it's in production. If it's not in production, I have to worry about it. And what that means in practice is if we're working on a larger feature, we've got to decompose it every day we're deploying, and it's dark, it's dark, it's dark, it's dark, it's dark, it's dark, it's dark. It's dark. Now we can get to a point where we have a feature flag where we can enable it and start to verify. Uh, but it's always in production all the time, nonstop. Um, and I think that's, uh, frankly, I think it's the best way to do it. It depends on continuous delivery. It depends on a great system of testing to make sure that you have that confidence that you're actually not breaking anything. Uh, but boy, is it nice to go to sleep knowing that everything is working and there's no outstanding work to do. Great question. Um, I think we're time? All right, we're at time. So happy to take your questions after. And thank you very much.